Good morning, my name is Michelle. Today is August 9th, 2010. I am in Denver, Colorado at the Servicios de la Raza. Is that That's correct? right. Okay, interviewing Emily Alvarado for the Voces Oral History Project. Thank you, Mrs. Alvarado, for agreeing to be interviewed. Um, I think we talked about that and said, um, and I'm assuming Lily told you earlier, all this information is gonna be housed in the Nettie Lee Benson Library on yes. the University of Texas, okay. Perfect. All right. Well, so we're going to start with your, with basically your growing up, your pre-war life, and then we'll get into the war periods and and post-war and and everything like that. Okay. okay. I was born in a uh, poor community in the Taos County, a little town called Cuesta, New Mexico. But I was just born there, and I was really raised in the Taos, the town of Taos itself. And uh, at three years old, my parents separated, later divorced at five. My dad took me to San Francisco. He became one of the Rosie the Riveters, not just uh, girls were Rosies, but he was a Rosie because he was too young for World War I and too old for World War II. Or no, yeah, I think that's the way it went. And um, when I was in uh, San Francisco, uh, the war had started and we did have radio, no television then, and it hadn't been invented. And um, we had, every neighbor had black curtains because uh, there was news that uh, Japanese warships were coming into the Bay Area. And uh, they'd sound an alarm and I would, uh, because my dad worked nights, I was there by myself. Uh, at that time, children could be left alone and the radio was my company. And uh, I would pull the curtains together to make sure no light came in. I'd get under the covers with my radio on, listening to the big band sounds, especially Frank Sinatra, who was a heartthrob of the times. Even if I was that young, I still really did like Frank Sinatra. And I love the big band sounds, I, every one of them. I learned to memorize all the songs. and. Uh, and then uh, the war was over. Oh, one thing, we had sugar, uh, where we couldn't buy sugar unless we had stamps. My dad couldn't get gas unless he had stamps. But he would give me a dime so I could buy a war stamp. Uh, the, whenever you talk to someone, it was always buy bonds, buy bonds. In other words, support the, the war effort. And uh, I had a lot of books that I filled up. In, giving my support. We also, I loved hamburgers, but it wasn't until later that I learned that there were horse burgers. We were eating horse meat instead of hamburgers because all the meat went to our military. And uh, then that was it for San Francisco. We came back to New Mexico. My dad remarried. And at this point in time, I went with my mother to Denver, Colorado. And here it was in Denver that I started going to school. and. Um, junior high and high school, graduating from Annual Training High School in 1953. And this was during the Korean War conflict. And the Korean War conflict, I saw, well, one of the, two of the young fellows that were going to, from graduation, one was going to the Airborne and the other one was going to Navy. And uh, the Airborne ended up being killed, which was very sad. And I remember him mostly, and I remember the Navy boy because we had a date to say goodbye, my best friend and I. But these two guys are very fresh. They wanted to get under my sweater. So my girlfriend and I, we said we're going to the bathroom. We went and sat on the second floor and watched the rest of the movie and took off through another doorway. So we felt pretty bad because he did get killed, you know, and that was. The one that got killed was my girlfriend's uh, date at that time. And so that was the Korean conflict. It was um, a lot of pain and, and concern for the young men because many of them were kids that you saw going through junior high and high school with you. And then we went into the Vietnam era the Vietnam era was uh, an exciting time. My brother joined the Marines. 
Um, he was a tough Marine. He survived it. He's still alive, and he's uh, involved very heavily at the Vet Center in in Phoenix, Arizona. And he's involved uh, volunteering a lot with the veterans in uh, uh, Carl Hayden Veteran Hospital there in Phoenix. Well, anyway, it was during this time that uh, a lot of us felt that Vietnam should not be, you know, our soldiers especially when you saw so many of them die in Korea, you wanted them home. So uh, um, we joined an organization, my, my husband, Ray Alvarado, who was a World War II hero, my hero too. Um, he thought it was wrong because so many of our people, the Hispanics or Chicano or uh, Latino, we're, we go by so many different names. Me, I go by, I'm an American Chicano. To the south is my ancestors, to the east is my other ancestors, but I was born in America. And uh, he uh, noticed that uh, a lot of the, our people, the Chicano, I'll go with that for, for the interview, were uh, not getting the employment that they should have, and they had many children. We joined an organization called the Crusade for Justice. And the Crusade for Justice was, um, they called it a militant. But how could you be a militant when I had all our eight children going to that school? Well, seven of our children were going to that school. The oldest one was too busy raising her family. And um, I had um, other ladies that had their children, like Rudy, the person who were responsible for this nice place that we have here. Uh, she had eight children also, and to me that doesn't sound like a militant group. And we were all involved as parents. We were working the kitchen, cleaning the bathrooms, cleaning the hallways. We were involved. And the purpose for that was education for our children, jobs for our husbands, and, um, and civil rights. We were very supportive of uh, not only the Chicano movement, as it was called, but we were supportive of the, the uh, black movement at the time, uh, Martin Luther King. We were supportive of uh, the AIM, the American Indian Movement. And uh, these are all the minorities who were struggling for uh, what was right as our heritage as American citizens. And it was during this time that uh, we had La Raza Unida. This is the race united. Raza in Spanish means race, and unida means united. And uh, I ran against uh, Wellington Webb, who later became the mayor of, uh, at that time I was running against him for House of Representative. And he later became mayor after he finished his uh, term because he won at uh, in the House of Representative. And uh, La Raza Unida, that was uh, an eye-opener. And here again, uh, a lot of activity was taking place. Many of our youth were killed. I remember one time, because we had music background, my husband and I were entertainers. To raise family, we had to work two jobs apiece to raise a big family that we had. and. Uh, I remember one time we were supporting the Crusade for Justice, and this was for the injustice of uh, the educational system, the way our children were treated. In fact, um, Corky Gonzalez, who was Rodolfo Corky Gonzalez, who was the founder of the Crusade for Justice, also the founder of Escuela Tlatelolco, Colegio Tlatelolco, and um, we uh, we started that because of the fact that. The school system, the mothers, uh, Mrs. Gonzalez and I, and many of the Crusade for Justice mothers, we started interviewing the different schools throughout the Denver metropolitan area. And we found that one school had animals. I mean, it was a little jungle that they had there to teach them the biologies. Another one, a telephone company had set up a whole telephone system for the school. And another one, they, uh, books, they were up to date. I remember what really angered me is that the school where my children went to, there were 35 students to one teacher. 
before we joined the Escuela Tlatelolco, and they had one, um, what was it, not magnifying glass, but to, to see germs and what have you. Oh, uh, microscope. Yes, they had one for the 35 students. When I went to this one school, every child had, a, had one. And then they open the doors to show us where the supplies that they use, the history books that they use, they were up to date. We are using 10, 12 year old school. In, our, in the public schools, they were using these old books and not up to date. And this particular school had, had so much supplies they could have given it to other schools, you know, but no, they stored them. And that angered me too, yeah, you know. Um, you see the, the contrast and comparison that's happening with public schools in one area and public schools in the barrio, which is where our people are located, or the ghetto, where our people are located. And we were very involved in that, in that school. We wanted to make a difference. We wanted to give positive thought to our children and uh, Many of the children really did wonderful. They graduated. We taught them to be proud of who they were through the culture, through the dance, through the music, through the arts, through the educational um, involvement period. And the parents were all involved. My husband was uh, a bus driver. He would pick up the kids in five different barrios to bring them to the Escuela Tlatelolco. And we didn't teach them kindergarten, first grade, second grade, on up to 12th grade. No, we taught them the tribes of their ancestors. Not the conquistador, but the tribe of the Indian mother. So the, the preschool was called Omeka, the, the oldest tribe. And then it was a Maya, then it was uh, Chichimeca, Zapoteca Mixteca, Nahuaclaca, et cetera, et cetera. And that was the learning. They had to know who they were as a total person. And I think that we have produced some great kids out of that. Positive kids that uh, know their rights as American citizens and uh, are taking advantage of that. Um, going through the school system, uh, our son, we just went to see our son, Ray uh, Jr. He graduated with his master's in Indian law in uh, Washington State. And uh, his daughter, who graduated from high school the same year, I mean this year, like my son, uh, she's going on to the University of Oregon. And uh, she was chosen out of her district to be the all-star in basketball. So I think that positiveness has traveled on to our grandkids. And we have, uh, out of our eight children, we have 26 grandchildren and 28 great-grand. My husband's 88, and you know my age. I just told you when I was born. So um, um, that's it in a nutshell for me. I, uh, I can't think of anything else that I could say at this time, except um, we continued on with our music, and um, our music is, um, right now at the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C. It's called the Chicano Movimiento Album. And all royalties went to the school to keep it going, and which it is. It's under the leadership of Corky Gonzalez's daughter, the oldest daughter, the firstborn, Nita Gonzalez. And we're very proud of her. And we're very proud of the son, who you met, Rudy Gonzalez. And he gave us this beautiful place here to have all these interviews. And of course, I'm mostly proud about my World War II husband. I want to tell you about him and take it away from me for a while. My World War II husband joined the military right after CC camps, these uh, conservation corps. And um, the reason for that, they'd just come out of the uh, Great Depression. And uh, thanks to President Roosevelt, the WPA, they were able to give jobs to our youth, and he said he received $5 a month, and the rest of the money went to his mother, and uh, that helped with the, she was a widow, and she had um, six children, and so um, she had, he had two other brothers that also went to the CC camps. He was in there two years, the other brothers were in there only one 
year of peace. And he, joined, he was drafted into the Army. He was in the 504 Engineering. And while he was traveling across the Mediterranean on Convoy 26, they were on their way to the um, China, Burma, India, the CBI theater. And there were uh, many ships. Uh, at, uh, during World War II, we weren't prepared for war. We were at war in the, uh, with Germany and also with Japan. And because we weren't prepared for war, my husband would, um, he would practice with a wooden gun until he was able to get a real gun to take care of. And be, I guess it was with him all the time. And um, anyway, we didn't have ships. So in this convoy, we had ships from everywhere else. He was on the HMT Rona, His Majesty's Transport. And as they were traveling uh, the Mediterranean, it was during the Malta Conference when uh, President uh, Roosevelt, uh, Churchill, and uh, Chiang Kai-shek and Stalin were meeting. And since these heads of state were all meeting, they left the Mediterranean and this convoy without any support because every, all power went to support these heads of state. And so there was a German uh, attack on the, on the convoy 26 and one of the one of the planes had a missile, an aerial missile, and it went directly to the HMT Rona of the two thousand men that were on that ship. Within a half hour, one thousand one hundred and thirty eight lost their lives, one hundred and seventy seven of them lost their lives in the hospital, plus more later on. My husband saved five men. He saved Captain Johnson, Sergeant Snyder, and three British crewmen. He was in the waters of the Mediterranean over 12 hours. He said that when, when the aerial missile hit, everybody was in uh, the eighth deck, which is eight stories down, and they were told to remain there. And he had this life belt called the Mae West. And uh, some joker, Jose Martinez, he went around punching everybody's life preserver. And of course, when you push the capsules, it would explode it and, and activate it. Well, it scared the heck out of him, and he knew he couldn't get any more capsules because they'd already ran out, because guys like Jose going around, horsing around like that. Ray turned around, he says, if we get hit, I hope you don't make it, you SOB. You know how guys talk. And uh, he says that everybody was looking out portholes, and, and they were saying, oh, they're coming, look, they're shooting, and, and all that excitement. And he just sat down and started playing cards with, um, with some of the guys that were like him, just playing cards. Uh, I think they were playing poker. He said he had the dead man's hand. I think that's supposed to be three queens and two something or other. And he told Hernandez, he says, hey, let me have a couple of bucks. I have a great hand. He says, I'll pay you a payday. And uh, Hernandez gave him the couple of bucks. This poor Hernandez, when his mother found out that he was the one that was killed in the European theater because they kept his secret. This happened November 26, 1943, and was kept secret until October 2000, when Metcalf from the Washington State brought it to Congress and says, this has got to be out in the open. But if you, uh, thanks to the um, uh, federal, um, the FOIA Act, federal, um, uh, mm, it passes me right, and I'm a government worker, and I can't think of the, it's the acronym FOIA anyway. And uh, we were able to get a lot of the paperwork showing it did happen. It showed how many ships were on there. We have all of that. Well, anyway, my husband was sitting playing cards, and the, uh, the power of the missile when it came in, it was like someone hit him on the head, he said. He saw himself spinning around, getting small like a little pea. And he says, I'm on my way to hell, and I deserve it. I've been so mean with my mother. Now, that's a young man talking. And then all of a sudden he stopped and he started growing again. When he came to, it was smoke and blood. And because of vacuum that this missile had created coming in through the walls of the ship, it wasn't a torpedo because it didn't come below. It came from above straight to the engine room. That's why the ship went down so quickly. And... Uh, 
the men that were in there, only three were intact, and that was Lieutenant Wood who was slammed against uh, the wall and there were hooks there, I guess maybe for the coats or whatever, but that kept him intact. But the other men were piled up into pieces and um, he knew he had to get out of there. Uh, Trevino came out of the darkness from somewhere. He's not even part of that group. He must have fallen from above or something. And um, he called Trevino, Lee Trevino was his name, probably a relative of the, of the golfer, maybe not, who you knows. But anyway, uh, he says, help me blow this up. So he took one side, because it was a, a double tube, he took one side of the tube and Trevino the other, and together they started blowing it up and just blew it up enough. And then he saw Snyder crawling against the edges towards the hole. He knew he had to get out of there, but Trevino went into the blackness. He says, no, don't. He says, come with me. If you go back into the blackness, you're going to die, Trevino. And sure enough, he's one of the 829 names that went down with the ship. And um, anyway, he, he knew he had to get out of there, so he started crawling over the bodies. He'd reach for a head for leverage, and the head would roll off. He'd reach for a hand, and the hand would come off. So to this day, because of that, he has post-traumatic stress disorder, big time. And uh, so he finally gets over there, and he sees Snyder, Sergeant Snyder, falling to the, into the waters. And he sees uh, it wasn't a, a lifeboat. It was just like a piece of wood with ropes hanging on it. And this is where uh, they transfer products from the deck to the ship or from the ship back to the deck. And he says it was like a hand lifted me. I no longer hit, no sooner hit that water, he said, and boom, I was there right on that uh, plat, plank and with uh, ropes. And I reached out for Snyder, he says, and I pulled him in. I started tying him up, but some of the rope was so... It wasn't strong, it would fall into pieces, but he finally got him secured because he was groaning, his back was really uh, uh, hurt, and he was a lumberjack from Idaho. In fact, what's exciting about this is his mother, who was an old lady, wanted to meet the man that saved her baby, so she made the treacherous uh, trip from Idaho to meet Ray and to thank him. Well, anyway, um, they were in the waters over 12 hours, like I said. He said he saw the ship, and the ship was like the 4th of July. Everything was just going like, it was like the 4th of July. He says everything was just exploding. It was a beautiful sight and fearful. And then he saw that some of them were able to get into lifeboats, and guys were hitting them because they were already too dangerous at the water level for more to get on that ship. So they were pushing him away with the oars and hitting him with the oars. And then he wondered why nobody came back to help the ones that were still alive. He heard the screaming. And once the ship went down, it became totally dark because this was in November 26, 1943, was wintertime. And, and uh, he says that the treacherous waves were like 15-foot swells. And finally, he saw that a couple of ships did come back for survivors, and he would see lights. But just as the light would come to hit their little raft, he says it would go down a swell and the light would just pass over. And it kept going like that, and finally there was nothing. It was just blackness. And then he says the, the waters, oh, there were three British crewmen, and they were Hindustani and they weren't prepared for the cold winters because they had this diaper type of uniform on them. And uh, they had gotten a hold of a little one, uh, like his, but smaller. And he says, throw me a rope. I have a bigger one, we'll stay together. And little by little though, he saw no matter how he tried to talk to him and sing to him and make jokes, he saw him fall into the water and never saw him again, one by one one fall in and then pretty soon another one and then another one. He says it just broke his heart because he became real friendly with him. He wanted to learn Hindustani, which he teaches me. Salam alaikum sahib. I have no idea what I'm saying. Or others. He want to know how to say, do you have a sister? <laughs> He's a character, my hubby was. And is. I shouldn't say was. He is. And so, uh, uh, 
it was treacherous with the swells, he said, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, it just started getting very, very calm. Mm. And even as dark as it was, he saw a darker, like, bobbing towards him. And then he heard a voice saying, please help me, I'm Captain Johnson, please help me. If you don't help me out of these waters, I will drown, I will die. So he reached out for him and brought him. He says, I have a flashlight. And this is very odd. But with the Freedom of Information Act, that's what I was trying to think of, Freedom of Inf for the FOIA, um, this is the most oddest of all. And I don't care, my husband said it, was, it did happen in 43. He says, I have a flashlight. Not only does it glow up in the air, but it glows on the water. And uh, according to Mr. Holcomb, who worked in Washington, D.C., he says, you know, Ray, you told us about that flashlight, but you know that that flashlight was not discovered, not created until 1945, two years later? He says, I don't care. That was God that I saved. If it wasn't Captain, jo uh, Captain Johnson, that was God, God's angel, because I had that flashlight. And he says it was just starting to break, not quite dawn, but just enough to see a silhouette of a ship. And he says, give me that flashlight. He says, I don't care if it's German, I want out of these waters. And he put himself up on his uh, side and a light flashed on him. They came together and uh, it was a USS Pioneer, one of our ships. And the USS Pioneer was, uh, they saved over 600, 605 men I mean, they were dangerous already because they had a full crew plus these 600. And they, when they put, put them all into the, into the USS Pioneer, they took them to the first uh, mate's quarters. And uh, the next day they had him, uh, he doesn't remember that, he just woke up on the beach and they had him lined up and they were going tagging because these guys were dead. They were tagging the guys and they were tagging him. And he's real sensitive on his feet. And he moves his feet and he says, hey, this guy's alive. So they took him to a tent place, like a tent hospital. And then they moved him from there to another bigger tent hospital. And then they took him to a real hospital in Bone, Africa. Now this was, they started off in Oran and Bijou was where the ship went down and he ended up in Bone, Africa. And uh, when we went to, uh, uh, in fact, I have, uh, I have the uh, telegram that they sent his mother to tell her that the hus the, her son was getting out of the hospital. I brought a copy of that so I could give to you so you can make copies of that. Yeah. And uh, anyway, uh, let's see, where was I at? Oh, when we went to North Africa in 2003 or 2002, we went in um, December. It was during the time that uh, Blair and uh, President Bush and all these issues with Saddam was taking place. And it was pretty rough out there. It was a rough time to be there, especially a lot of people didn't want to go to North Africa, which was, we actually went to Spain. And uh, North, a uh, North Africa is just like eight miles from the Rock of Gibraltar, and a lot of the people took that um, ferry across and I didn't want to go because I'd heard from the other ones that had gone earlier that they were spitting on their food, they were kicking them when they walked by and it was just really bad news. But I says, but we're close to um, Carthage which is uh, located it's, uh, like a suburb to Tunis, Tunisia. And I says, we can get a flight for $300 for you and I because they're having this golf thing out there and you get two nights at a hotel and the flight and food. And so I said, we're never gonna come this way again. I don't like to travel. I said, I don't wanna come outside of the USA. I'm gonna see the USA first, I told him. And I says, let's get this flight. Let's go and let's see where these men are buried. It'll be a good closure for you. And he agreed. So we flew to Madrid. From Madrid, we went to uh, Tunisia and we uh, flew into Tunis, which is a city. Tunisia is a country. And uh, we hired, we stayed at that hotel, and we hired a uh, cab driver to take us to Carthage to the uh, North African American Cemetery. And I have that letter 
where um, we met uh, uh, Sergeant Green. He's an ex-Marine that's the superintendent of the North African American Cemetery. And uh, my husband proceeded to tell him. In fact, when he signed on the guest book, he signed just below Rumsfeld's name. We just missed him. And they did taps for, uh, for us, you know, just the two of us, and we had a reef. And uh, they, I got pictures of my husband and I that Mr. Green took of us in, at the North African American Cemetery with all its emblems and everything. And uh, when we were going, he says, Mr. Green says, all these, they're all saying November 27th, the next day, because that's the day they were buried there. And I have no idea why there's so many of them on that same day. So my husband proceeded to tell him about the story about the Rona. And then he's, on the wall there was this beautiful artwork that the North African people know how to do. And it showed the, um, the beach of uh, North Africa, the land uh, area, and it showed the Mediterranean. And then in, in the land area there were 829 names, the men that had gone down with the ship. And, and so we started going to see the different graves and different crosses that were there with their names. And uh, my husband remembered this, oh, this is Duck, and you know, he had nicknames. He has a great memory. For 88 years old, my husband has a wonderful memory. And then he stopped for a while and just rested on one of the crosses. And I says, Ray, I says, look at the name on that cross. I says, that's Jose Martinez. At that point in time, my husband collapsed. And he got on his knees and he cried and he says, I didn't mean it, buddy. I didn't mean what I said. I was just so angry that time when you did that. And you scared the heck out of me. I didn't mean it. I wish you had made it, buddy. You should have. He says, you're a better man than me. All these men are better men than me. I don't know why I'm still alive, he said. So then we left, came back to America, but that was very good for him. Um, I, I think I'll stop for a second. <laughs> okay. Um, you mentioned, um, for example, like the black curtains, like the, yes. the blackouts. Can blackouts, you, yeah. yeah, there were blackouts, and uh, it is because they said that there were uh, warships, Japanese, because we're in San Francisco now, we're talking about the war at that end of the world. <laughs> And uh, they had spotted some submarines, Japanese submarines, coming up. But it was just a spotting. And I don't know. I was still a kid, so I don't really know uh, that much about it, you know. It's just what I'd hear my dad say. But he gave me strict instructions, you know. I was to climb here and pull them together. But I noticed that my cousins who were there, too, uh, many of them went there because uh, in Taos, New Mexico, the little town, the majority of, went, of them went to Japan to fight. And they were in the Bataan uh, War March, that uh, death march. And um, so many of the wives went to work out there with their children. And I know that uh, many of them were related to me and we all had black curtains. And that's what I remember. Okay. Mm -hmm. You said uh, you would hide under your covers and listen to the radio. Do you remember what radio stations you would listen to? I don't or? remember the don't radio remember. station. All I know, there were the big band sounds of, uh, oh, Gads, um, uh, uh, Miller, um, Shaw, or maybe not Shaw. I think he came later. But I liked all that smooth. You know, at that time, there were a lot of love songs. People were hurting. It wasn't the wild songs of today, and I probably sound like my mother did, you know, with the jitterbug, because it was jitterbug too. And uh, you know, that was the devil's dance. And and now, with the kids, you know, they go into this crazy stuff. But I shouldn't complain because my husband and I took line dancing. We've been going line dancing for almost two years, and uh, that's a lot of fun. I I think. If you get into it yourself, you're going to find out, hey, that's not too bad. That's pretty good. It's good exercise. Keeps some body motion going, and that's good for you. Keeps you young. Yeah, yeah, yeah it does. Yeah, dancing's good It's for a lot you. of fun. Yeah. I'd rather do that than exercise. Yeah. 
<laughs> Me too. <laughs> okay. Um, did you listen to any Spanish language radio? Growing? No, not really. Uh, my dad went to Harvard. Um, not the Harvard that we know. There was it burned down, and uh, he wanted me to be um, more English speaking than Spanish speaking. I spoke Spanish with my aunts and and grandma and grandpa and that, but uh, he wanted me to have no accent, and he really concentrated on my English for me. Um, so. We were mostly, around him, I was English speaking. And, and being in San Francisco, naturally, that's where I go, went to school. I don't remember the name of the school. I didn't put that down in the paperwork because I don't remember. I just remember it was a gold school going up the hill. There were so many hills in San Francisco, though. And um, I went one time with my husband to check out Turk Street. That I remember it was 1159 Turk Street. I had to memorize that in case I got lost. And um, it didn't exist, it's buildings. So, but uh, no, I don't remember. All I know, it was uh, beautiful music. Uh, I learned so many of the songs and, and uh, I did learn a few songs by, uh, let's see, uh, let's see, now Frank Sinatra was my favorite, but there was also uh, Bing Crosby. I like Bing Crosby, and uh, he sang one that was in English and Spanish that I really liked, and that was You Belong to My Heart, Solamente Una Vez. I like that one, and uh, well, I just learned a lot of the songs there, and I continued with the radio. When I went with my mom, though, and uh, after my dad married again, I was with my dad. Oh. I would say until 1945, right after the war, he married, and he's, he had um, um, a life that he wanted to build with his wife, so he sent me with my mom, and um, my mom loved Spanish music, so did my aunts and everybody. They used to listen to a man named Paco Sanchez, but I can't remember the name of the station here in Denver, and uh, that's what you'd hear all the time. And I didn't have a radio with my mom. I did not have a radio, so I missed out on that. And my aunt was in control of her radio, and my mom was in control of her radio, if she did ever get one. And my sister, she had a, a Victrola and these uh, long playing records. And uh, she had her music, which I liked too. She was doing Sarah Vaughan and and uh, oh, a lot of nice music too. I like that too. But uh, she was working, so she bought the records and she played what she wanted to play. I was not allowed to get any of her stuff, being the little sister. So that's the way it goes. <laughs> I know all about that. I was the younger sister <laughs> yeah, you too. You know about that. I know yeah. all about that. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Um, so, did your dad, uh, did he make you speak, was he trying to protect you from discrimination? Was there a lot of discrimination? I or? didn't understand discrimination until I came to Denver. Because in Denver, I knew a lot of the kids and they talk, talked in Spanish and I knew it. So, you know, it's not like I was ignorant. I knew Spanish, but I talked mostly, mostly with my dad in English and in San Francisco is more more English than it was Spanish, unless it was around my family, which was once in a while, and uh, for a short time, you know, for a dinner or something like that. But um, I remember at school, you would get whacked down. The teachers would really come down hard on you if you uh, spoke Spanish in school. That's why I never taught my children. I would refuse to teach my children, but they still learned. The oldest speaks wonderfully well in Spanish and English, all of them. And through song, too, they learned a lot of the Spanish, too, down to the youngest. But I didn't want them to go through the dehumanization, you know, the, it's just not very good feeling for a child. You're innocent. And uh, to make you feel like, I don't know, it made you feel very strange. Yeah. And I didn't want that for my children. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can understand that. Yeah. 
Um, so let's see. So your dad worked nights. Um, yes, he when, did. When he, what did he do? He was a Rosie the Riveter. Right, right. <laughs> so what, what did he work at? Do you know anything? In the shipyards, him? that's all I know. Um, He'd tell me stories. Like one time he says he came across a shark because he fell into the water. But I think he was joking because he says he just put out his arm like that and the shark just hit him like that. And went around by the time he went around because he was so big, he got in out of there. And I think he was just telling me stories. I really don't know. You know, uh, just a kid listening to stories. So I don't know. All right. Well, how old were you when you went with your mom again? I was 10. 10. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. What did your mom do? Did she, was she working? My mom or? worked three jobs. So, um, you know, she was taking care of not only my sister and I, but also my grandmother. And uh, my mom's sister, her husband had become ill. He died of cancer. And so she would help also so she was working three jobs and um, so we were kind of a knit family together until she married my mom married three times my dad married three times they outlived practically all their spouses and uh, I remember that uh, my mom when she married uh, my stepdad his name was Tony Gonzalez wonderful man uh, he was working at the Army Depot in Utah. And I says, what do you do, Dad? Because I call all of them Dad. I love them all. I what do you do, Dad? And he says, oh, I, uh, we make bullets. And I check them. And I hit each bullet, make sure it works. Of course, he was always kidding around with me like that, too. And I, I remember that uh, at the, uh, it was called Twila, Utah at the depot there at Todd Park it was called the uh, Todd Park in Twila Utah and I remember that uh, uh, he says uh, do you want a job I says yeah so he had me s delivering newspapers to the little depot area there so uh, I always wanted a bicycle but they wouldn't get me a bike but they got me a red wagon and then uh, that's when uh, I had a lot of fun, met a lot of people, learned uh, skills of uh, communicating and what have you, and I really liked that. Learned how to give cash and uh, collect money and with a smile and a thank you when they gave me candy or something. Mm -hmm. Those are good skills to have, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so tell me a little about, so you were in junior high and high school during Korea, the Korea conflict? Right. So, uh, well, no more. Uh, let's see. It was in '50 when I uh, continued from coal. So the Korean conflict. I said I think it started in the late '50s, didn't it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, by '53, a lot of our when I graduated from high school, a lot of our young men were going into the Korean conflict. Mm -hmm. So tell me. So I I don't know a whole lot about like the, you, you hear a lot about during World War II the patriotism that was going on back in the States oh, and then Viet Vietnam, all of the, you know, the protests and stuff. I don't really know about like a lot about what was going on in the States during the Korean conflict. Was there, was there uprisings? Was there patriotism? Not that I know there? of. Uh, not in our school. I mean, we just come out of a big war and to know that our men were going to another horrible incident. I mean, I think, um, I think it was more praying for our young people than, than anything else, you know. Um, I just never was involved in, there was never any um, walkouts, uh, you know, against the war uh, that I can remember of Korea. I, I don't remember any of that. So it was just kind of a, did it feel kind of like a continuation of World War II as far as, like, no. you're just going back into war? No, uh, it, it was too real because World War II, I was a child, you know, I was seven when I was putting those curtains together, <laughs> but uh, I was 17 when I was facing young men that were leaving and, uh, and even women. I, this one gal, she was my friend, she joined the Navy and she came back to visit us. And this was when I was a junior. She was a senior when she joined the Navy and got out of high school. And 
she came back with her uniform, and I thought, oh, I want to do that. I want to be that, you know? But my mom wouldn't let me. She says, nope, she wouldn't sign for me. And that angered me, so uh, the first thing I wanted to do is get married then. I wanted out of the house. I think I was a typical teenager then. And uh, the choice was not a wise one. Um, I married a young man, had two beautiful sons with him. Um, but uh, that ended up in divorce. And not only that, but uh, he was later killed. Mm -hmm. how, how was he killed? You know, he mommy. was shot down. From what I hear, I, I don't really know all that facts, but mm -hmm. he was killed and shot uh, in a parking lot. Oh, mm -hmm. no. Mm -hmm. okay. But um, uh, because I never, he never came to see the children or anything, I was never in that way. Uh, his name was uh, William Jennings Bryant, and he went by Billy. Oh, that's terrible. That's terrible. So when did you meet your, your husband? I met him. My mother was, uh, she had a little restaurant in El Chapultepec, which is very popular now uh, as a jazz place. But then it was just a regular place. And she had the restaurant part, and then there was a bar part. And I was working at Frontier Lines, so when I get out of work, I'd go and I'd take over the little restaurant while they went to go to sleep because they'd come back for the late crowd and this give them a rest. And the food was already made. All I'd have to do is make sure everything was in order. And on a Friday, Saturday, Ray Alvarado and his brother Manuel and another young man would come in and entertain the bar area. Well, I heard this beautiful music, especially my husband was a fantastic guitarist. He's what you call a requintero, which is a lead guitar. And I'd hear these beautiful Mexican love songs. Oh, man. I, I would just, where the food went in, you know, you'd put burritos into a tray and put the tray out there and someone on the other side would take it in. Well, I got to the habit where I not only put the tray there, I'd go around and take the food to them. And uh, I told him one time, oh, you play such great guitar. I told Ray. His brother sang beautifully, but it was a guitar that won me over. And I says, you really play wonderful guitar. I says, would you teach me? And he says, yes, I will. So uh, he would teach me. And uh, I got to know him. He was very quiet. When I first met Ray, he was very, very quiet because he'd just come out of burn unit. He was still wearing the, um, his face had to be all reconfigured. He had lost his entire nose and they took cartilage from his ears to build up the nose here. And uh, he lost a finger. But what he did with a, three fingers that a man does with a whole hand was amazing. And uh, anyway, uh, that went on for about a year and a half. And I told him, have you ever been married? He told me he was married when he had the four children. And of course, I had my two. And I says, were you ever married by the church? And he says, no. I says, oh, would you marry me? I told him. He says, no, you're not my type, he tells me. I says, OK, that's what the wrong thing to tell this girl. <laughs> I says to myself, uh-uh. No, nope. he ended up marrying me, and uh, I was, uh, I became more involved with him, and I was singing in the choir, and because he knew how to read note and everything else, um, the choir master had to leave at uh, Sacred Heart Catholic Church. He had to leave on vacation or something. He was looking for someone to take over the choir as leading the choir. I said, my husband, or not my husband, at that time we were just going together, I says, he knows how to read music, and he can do that. Because he'd just sit and wait for me to finish with the choir, and then we'd go together, you know. And he says, uh, oh, okay, Ray, then you take over. And he did. <laughs> he was always so kind. So uh, we started making arrangements to get married. We ta I talked to Father Brady. We went through our bonds and everything, uh, everything we have to do as a Catholic, uh, in a Catholic membership. But then he says, I really don't want you to marry him. He tells me the priest did, and which 
a couple of years back, I went to tell him, you know, we've been married 43 years, I told him at that time. I says, um, I just want to let you know that. And, oh, that's wonderful, he tells me. That was Father Brady. And he says, uh, I, oh, I told Father Brady, I says, you didn't want me to marry him. You told me so. He says, oh, I don't think I told you that. I says, yes, you did, because he had four children. Well, maybe I did tell you that, he said. <laughs> so anyway, to make a long story short, we ended up getting married. And, um, and pretty soon on our honeymoon, he wanted me to meet his daughter. And she was living with her mom in Casper, Wyoming. So my honeymoon was going to Casper to meet his daughter. And we had a wonderful time. She's a wonderful girl. And we got along just right off the bat, wonderfully. And as soon as she graduated, she went and she joined us. My, uh, the oldest son, I call them my children. I've never, I don't call them anything else but my children because I love them so dearly. Uh, he was already living, the oldest boy was already living with Ray. And uh, when I'd get off of work, I'd go see them both. And he wanted to play poker with me, and he'd always beat me. Took me for more coins than you can imagine. That was Isaac. So when we were getting married, uh, I told Isaac, we've got to find a place. But nobody wanted to rent us a place because there was five children. And uh, uh, let's see, yeah? No, there was four, four six children. And... Um, most of them were boys, except for two, because when Connie graduated from Casper, Natrona High School, she moved in with us in our new place. And uh, they didn't want to rent us this place because there was too many boy children. So we ended up in a two-bedroom apartment house. Uh, that was kind of like, um, it wasn't really, I don't know if it was like a townhouse, but it wasn't really a townhouse. It wasn't called a townhouse, it was like a house but yet there were attachments to it. And uh, so uh, our first furniture was, of course, bunk beds with all the kids we had. And then uh, we had uh, our bedroom. And that was tight, but it was fun. We had a lot of laughter, a lot of fun in, uh, in our house. And Isaac, for some reason, he decided, well, Connie came and moved in. He's going back to Casper to be with his mom. So he left to be with his mom. And uh, I remember the first time Connie, the oldest girl, had her job. We were all excited. I mean, this is her first paycheck. And she's showing it to everyone. I remember my little, at that time, he was five years old. And uh, Carlos. And he saw how excited we were about this money that she had gotten. So when everyone was asleep, he went and took her little, it was a little envelope with her money, and he started putting some money here. And at that time, we had a little baby. And he's Ray Jr. He's our former Airborne Ranger. And uh, he stuffed some money in his diaper, and he put some money here, wanting to make everybody happy. So there was crazy things that uh, happened with all the children, you know, in our in our um, life together and then we found out that we could get a house because Ray was military and he was honorable discharge two times so we went in and talked to him we were able to buy a house furnished furnished and everything I mean God was so merciful and so wonderful he gave us this antique furniture it was right across a huge park we had a double lot uh, $6,000, which was something wonderful in 1966. That was before this big booming whatever. And so uh, um, the kids wanted the basement, the boys. So naturally my washing machine didn't go down there, it went to second floor. But everything worked out. We had a lot of fun there and that's when we joined the Crusade for Justice at that time and became involved with them. and and. Uh, I was telling you, I started telling you earlier about the uh, walkouts that we would do, you know, because of education. Let I me, didn't finish that. Yeah, let me stop you right there. Let yes. me change this tape, and uh, and we can talk about thing as they just kind of piece it all together, and that's that's just part of the editing process. You have to listen mm -hmm. to the whole thing and mm -hmm. chop it up and rearrange mm -hmm. it and make it make it flow a little bit. But all right. All right, so this is take two of Mrs. Alvarado's interview in Denver, Colorado, August 9th, 2010. 
Okay, so tell me about tell me about these walkouts. I'm the very walkouts. interested in this. Okay, yeah. I, I remember that we would we would play our guitars and we would lead the walkouts in many of them. And but this one particular one we did not play the guitars. I had my baby in my arms. My children were ahead of us with the other students and I had my little four or five year old that's my former Airborne Ranger one, the youngest one. This little guy was holding my hand when the police came by with hitting us with the sticks, the night sticks that they used. I'm pr trying to protect my little baby. I let go of my little four, maybe five year old. I know he was, he's four years between the baby and him. Do you remember what year this was? This was in 19, oh, Maybe he was three. No, he was four. He was four. This is about 1973 that okay. this happened. Okay. And because uh, she was born in 69. No, it was 1970. She was born in 69, so it could have been anywhere between 69 and 70. Oh, I hate to get old because you kind of lose time. All I know is the story is I had my baby in my arms and my boy in my right hand. And I let go of him just to cover my baby, so if, if I got hit, it would be me, but not the child. And he took off. It took us a long time to find him. It was a scary moment in my life. And then, of course, the older ones were off running with the other kids, too, because it was civil rights movement of the times, you know? We we're looking for the education for our children, employment, we didn't want the uh, police brutality that was taking place. Um, uh, it was just uh, a times when you know you were living in dangerous times. Uh, you, you saw children that, that you knew were wonderful. One particular young man that we did, one of the albums talked about his story, was Luis Junior Martinez. He was not only teaching the children how to do the folkloric dance, but he was teaching the mothers, all right, come on, let's move those legs. Hey, ladies, <laughs> he would say. He was so, so nice. And he'd gone to a birthday party, and he'd walked across the street, stopped by the police for jaywalking, and shot and killed. We have no idea how that all came about. All I know is the child was dead. The mother was grieving. And... Uh, and when, when I told you earlier that I was with La Raza Unida, we were on our way to a convention for La Raza Unida. In fact, um, uh, there were quite a few of us that were going out of Denver. And I remember this one young man, his name was Ricardo Falcón. He stopped in to get water for his car, but he was gunned down by uh, the, uh, the man at the gas station and killed, leaving, of course, his son. Uh, and also a widow. And there were just so many stories that uh, touch your life because you come to care for these people. You became a family working under the Crusade for Justice. One of the things that Rodolfo Corkin Gonzalez, the founder, taught was to love each other. You know, and I learned to love people that were like me people that spoke two languages like I did, people that were brown like me. The children were beautiful children like mine. And uh, that's what he taught was love. But then we'd go out of that realm into the anger of the world, you know, and it was, it, it just enforced that love, I think, to me anyway. I can't talk about other Chicanos and Chicanas in the organization, but to me, and we would have, every Wednesday night, I remember we'd have a fisherman's meeting. That's what Corky called him. And in the fisherman's meeting, he would say, okay, you men, you're all leaders in this organization. Whatever you do, you stay with your wives. You love your wives and your children because there's going to be young people, young pretty girls that are going to try to attack attach themselves to you because you are a leader. There's just something about that. And he would advise and he would say, he would talk about the family, how strong the family should be. 
and how caring we should be uh, as mothers towards our children and our husband, how husbands should be caring towards the wives and, uh, and the children. We had, not only did we have uh, the fishermen's meeting at the Crusade, that's where the La Raza Unida for Colorado started. It also was, uh, we had a uh, bookstore. And uh, I remember one time that Corky came to us and says, you know, there's a young man, he's a good kid, just doesn't have a dad. And he's going to go to prison. His name's Alfredo Cisneros. He's really a good kid. How about he knew we already had all the children we had. He says, why don't you go to the courts and get him to be responsible for him? We did. That kid turned out, he graduated from college. He's now superintendent out in uh, Texas. In, um, uh, anyway, I think it's, uh, uh, I don't know if it's Beer Place or Pepsi Place. I can't remember. He used to come and see us all the time. But now he married and so... We stopped hearing from him, <laughs> but he always came by to see us. We were so proud of him. He really did well. And uh, there was uh, other times that maybe uh, a child was going to be born to a single parent, a young lady, and we would take that wow. mother in and help her out, buy her glasses because she needed glasses or something. You know, you were poor, but there was always enough to help, you know? And we had so much because we had this big house, big yard, across the street, this huge park. So it was easy for us to be, you know, opening our house to whoever or whatever they wanted. You know, I remember one time we had a Mexican artist named Lucha Villa and we had um, a mariachi and they came to our house to stay because we had the room, right? And. I wanted my brother-in-law to meet this beautiful actress, singer, but she didn't want him. She wanted my husband. He liked, she liked the way he played the guitar. Oh, that really angered me. Tell you the truth, I was kind of angry with that beautiful star, but she was only there for one day, so I, okay, she's gone. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, everything was always the familia, I know. Uh, we had a posada, and I had my daughter, uh, Cindy. She was uh, to play the Virgin Mary, and one of the other members' sons was uh, Joseph. And we were able to get a real live donkey, and Carlos, being my honorary kid, started poking around the donkey. Donkey bit him on the head. Got mad, boy came crying, and donkey bit me on the head. <laughs> it was always something like that. There were either, th these kids were so much fun. They were always fighting stray dogs, cats, uh, you name it. Duck, one time a duck had hurt his wing. I mean, we had ducks in the house. Oh, and with a cat that they found, this solid black cat called Spooky, that cat had every color that you could think of, solid white. She was totally black, but she had white cats. I could never understand that. So we're always giving cats away because I swear she had one every month. <laughs> it was something fantastic. But that was it. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. I go from one end of the spectrum to the other. I'm sorry. I'm no. trying to keep in. No. I'm you're... trying to keep it, but these yeah. memories keep flooding in. Oh, from... yeah. No, that's, that's great. Mm -hmm. So where do you think, um, how do you think the society would be now if uh, the La, La Raza Onida and the organizations that you were that you were involved with back then. How, where do you think the, the society would be now if that hadn't taken place? How do you think the Latinos and Chicanos and... With La Raza Unida, um, let's just say uh, mankind, I don't care what race it is, we're a fallen creature, you know? And power can change an individual dramatically. Right now we're getting ready to vote for uh, some men that are sincere. But power has a way of changing man. And uh, I don't trust man. I don't trust women. I don't trust man in that kind of a position because uh, they mean well at the very beginning. But then 
we have a system already in place that uh, is, uh, well, it will build power. That's why atrocities happen the world over. These are intelligent men that they have in office, no matter if it's here or in another country. But they do change. And uh, La Raza Unida is, uh, is still by men, whether it's Chicano or white or black. They're still men. Right now we have the wonderful fortune of having Obama, a black president. That's never happened before. Uh, he had some wonderful things to say at the beginning. And uh, here again, he's still a man, and uh, he's got a lot of power, but he can only do so much. It's Congress that's behind that. It's the people that's behind it that changes too. And all these combinations bring out sometimes something that you don't want to happen, but it would be the same, I think, no matter what. I really believe that, no matter what uh, party we have. Right now, who is it that's running under the Constitution, Tad Cradle? Um, I don't know. I guess if you want to know how it would have come out, it would have had to have been a reality and you, we would have seen it. But who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank God it, uh, it did exist. And uh, a civil rights struggle. Can uh, The civil rights struggle was a great time. It changed a lot. Um, we owe a lot to Martin Luther King. We owe a lot to men like Rudolfo Corky Gonzalez. Now, they weren't looking for power. They didn't have the money. They didn't have the backing of the big monies behind them. Martin Luther King didn't either. Um, the Indian nation didn't either. You know, they just believed that, hey, it has to be better for us as Americans. It has to be better. And uh, they were concentrating on family and the future for their family. And that's kind of a different realm had they been supported, say, by big monies, who knows what, what that would do. Money has a way of, of bringing out the beast in us, you know? Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> we know about that, being mm -hmm. a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm working on editing a video uh, by a gentleman who is very involved in some civil rights stuff in the end. And what I'm having trouble finding is um, information of how involved um, the Latino world was with the black American world, with Martin Luther King. Can they marched in the Poor People's uh, Campaign. They right. marched into Washington. And uh, Corky insisted that the people stay together. You know, they were concerned. Uh, it, it, regardless of how it was, you know, you went as a group, you stayed as a group. They were supportive and uh, there were Indian marches uh, marchers that went also, and um, I guess if you want to know more on, on that, I would recommend uh, maybe talking to the lady that was here with me, that was Corky Gonzalez's wife, because she knew the thoughts of Corky. She supported Corky 100%. She knows more than I did. Me, I was just a little worker bee supporting. I was editor of El Gallo. This, uh, Escuela Tlatelolco. Tlatelolco, by the way, is an Indian. Uh, there's a tra uh, Plaza de las Tres Culturas in Mexico City, and this is called Tlatelolco. And this is a three culture plaza in Mexico City, but it was there during the Olympics that, uh, of Mexico that they gunned down all those 500 students. Or at least uh, they say 500, but I think there was probably more. And it was all because of the fact that what are the people getting out of this, you know? Um, it was only the donors that were making the monies out of the Olympics. And from some conversations I heard, well, they get the meat of the bull that's killed in the bull ring. If you ever eat muscle bull, <laughs> I mean, that's not a big thing. 
Wow. Okay. But I would talk to her if you really, okay. uh, she's going to be back. So what I would do okay. is ask if you could talk to her yeah. And, yeah. and maybe ask her these questions. Get a little bit. Yeah. yeah. She's yeah. the best one because yeah. out of her comes whatever Corky would say. Okay. Because yeah. they were that close and they've been together. Yeah. I don't know how many years they've been oh, yeah. married. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you as a worker during all of this, the Poor People's March and, and all the civil rights struggle and stuff, mm -hmm. so tell me, um, tell me what you saw and what you experienced and, and what you thought about all these, um, you know, the marches and the, the all, everything. How, how did you view what was going on? What were you thinking about it? Well, from the experiences that I had in school with um, not being able to speak my language, which now is being taught in the school, um, it was very nice, you know, it was disrespectful, it was dehuman, it hurt you because you felt, uh, you know, you look at the other kids and they would laugh and what have you, you know. Um, you just, you just felt really beaten and broken inside, you know. Um, but you didn't want to stay there because then you went home and the world was okay again. You know, they loved you and you had love and, and uh, that was wonderful. But uh, as a grown person, um, my first husband was Anglo, and every time the mother would get mad at him, get out and take your Mexican wife with you, you know, that kind of thing. And I was living there with him because that's where he had me. So it was just uh, without insulting her, you know. She was basically a nice woman, but uh, I knew my place, you know. I knew my place very well. And uh, I know when my Carlos was born, he's very blue-eyed, dark-complected, I mean light-complected. And so was my other son, but this one was more light-complected and more blue-eyed. And the doctor would tell me, if I hadn't delivered that baby, I'd swear that wasn't your child, you know, that kind of thing. Um, you don't say anything because it's just ignorance talking and you recognize them. You, what can you say against ignorance without creating animosities? And uh, so you don't say anything, but it's those kind of things, you know? Yeah, yeah. So once all the, the marches and stuff, once ML, you know, Martin Luther King really got going and they were, you know, winning struggles and stuff, did it feel liberating? like? Finally, change was taking place, and maybe people would start to Actually, realize. Actually, you had compassion for the blacks because you saw how they were having dogs on them, and you saw the media what they were doing. Um, you saw that on your own. Um, for instance, there was this young man, wonderful artist, Manuel Emanuel Martinez, and. Uh, our people had gone to California for the uh, to support California folks, and uh, they they were at a park when they came in with gas. They shot and killed the media, Mr. Salazar, um, reporter, and one of the young ladies, uh, Martinez's wife. She was beaten so badly that uh, she became total vegetable. A young woman. Um, my husband, Ray, he, they arrested Corky, and so he went on a fast. He says, I'm not going to eat anything until Corky's released, because he shouldn't be in prison, you know. Um, we all knew that President Kennedy had says, you know, you have the rights as American citizen. If they don't listen to you, take to the streets. He said it, and he's a president, but yet the people weren't reacting and acknowledging what the president said. Our people were, but they weren't. 
And here again, it's the ignorance of man not understanding or not taking the time to know about another person. I know in my climb through my career, I wouldn't have been, I wouldn't be where I'm at today if it weren't for the fact that I climbed whenever a leader was married to a Hispanic, I would get that position. And it went that way various times, various times, various times, because they had that compassion, they had that understanding, hey, you know. And it's just people need to know about people. They're really quite the same. We're really all quite the same. And you really don't understand how people can be cruel like they, like they were. Um, I know uh, going to, to this day, you go through Idaho. In fact, I told you about my husband saving Sergeant Snyder. That man was racist with my husband. He was terrible with my husband. But you saw a change when he saved his life. And Idaho is a very racist state. I, we went through there to get gas, and my granddaughter, they wouldn't even wait on her because she's dark complected to get to fill the tank up with gas. So today's times is still there. You know, um, and it's when the association takes place, and may God give each and every person that has a racist bone in their body an opportunity to understand another group, a, a cultural group, through however he does, because he did this with Sergeant Snyder. He couldn't stand my husband, but you never saw. I got letters from Snyder where he sent his son, got married, pictures, Christmas pictures, graduation pictures, this picture, that picture, letters here. That was a man that was humbled because he was saved by a man he couldn't stand. <laughs> You know, it's just opening your mind and opening your eyes and understanding that, hey, people are, there's bad people and it comes in every race, it doesn't matter, but we're not all in that race of evil, you know. There's maybe a reason why they are evil, maybe it's a medical condition, maybe it's a drug situation, maybe it's... Who, who knows? If you don't know that person, you're not going to know what's making that person react like they do. Where do you think the, the racism comes from? Um, out of, where do you think the racism comes from out of people that aren't, you know, mentally ill or handicapped or anything like it that? It comes, I think, from the background of uh, how you're raised. I don't think a child is, is raised uh, racist. I know when I went to Manual High School here, and this is high school, um, there were kids, you know. Uh, didn't matter if they were Asian, black, white. They were our friends, you know. But somewhere along the line, some of them are, are raised a little bit different. And it may be because they have uh, experience that... Uh, you know, the blacks, they had the experience of having slaves, you know, and they had this glorious, wonderful traditions that they had, and these men and women had their place. They were to work the fields and provide this and that and the other. And um, maybe they were in San Francisco and they had Mexicans that they were the fields, the grapevines, and what have you, and uh, they spoke Spanish all the time, and you know they they had us classified as maybe lazy, um, and then they'd say, "Oh, those lazy Mexicans, or those dirty so and so," and on and on, you know. It, it starts. I don't think a child is born that way, but. We're taught that, and grown-ups have to change. And how they teach your children <laughs> their precious gifts from God. Yeah. Yeah.
Wow. So you've accomplished a lot in your life. You have an amazing story. Um, how do you? How would you describe your life if you could sum it up in into one or two sentences? How? I have been blessed. I have been so blessed. I thank every morning I get up. I thank the good Lord for another day of life that He gives my husband and I. We prayed for my husband to live to be 103, so he can see the youngest grandchild, see our our youngest daughter Raquel. Her husband is a custom home builder. He builds us. I said I wanted a little house. I don't want to clean a lot. What does he do? He builds a two-car garage, living room, bedroom, washroom, bathroom, kitchen. You name it, you know? But with a loft, I don't want the loft, it's sealed because uh, we don't want to climb no stairs. And uh, only 20 feet away. And we have four little grandkids, ages five months, six years, 10 years, and 12 years. So we are, that's a blessing. Uh, when I was 70, they threw me a big surprise. My children were all there except the one that I lost. And um, I was totally surprised when my husband turned 80, they threw another big party. We are such a tight, I am blessed because I have this huge family. At, to um, a Chicano family, you are rich if you have children and if you have good health. That's where you're rich, and that's where I'm at. You know? Yeah. That's great. That's mm -hmm. great. I, uh, Taylor and I next door, we interviewed uh, Mrs. Chavez in, where was it? It was, uh, it was in Sonora, Texas. And, uh, and that's how she described her life. She said, mm -hmm. I'm rich. I have a house. I have health. I've got kids. I'm rich. Mm -hmm. that, was, that, was, mm -hmm. that just made my skin tingle. And that comes from your background because um, in my mom's time, she was the thirteenth baby of the thirteenth of a thirteenth baby of my grandma and grandpa, and uh, he always called himself rich. His name was Trinidad, which means Trinity. And uh, he says that he, in any Hispanic from northern New Mexico or Latino or Chicano. From northern New Mexico, um, that's how they explained because they didn't have money. You know, they bartered everything. Uh, if somebody had a pig, they'd say, hey, I'll give you apples, uh, corn, whatever they grew. And they would exchange. Everything was bartered. So money was not ever anything big in our minds until now that we are educated. Now that we're educated, we know how important money is, you know. But uh, it wasn't that way. So did your parents grow up in Mexico or? Did New Mexico. New my, Mexico. Okay. My dad's family has been in the United States since 1698. The first group of, uh, of white settlers, as they called them, they were killed by the Native Americans. And then the next group came in, and that was my family's group. A land grant was given to them from Spain. And, uh, and at one time, we have maps in, in uh, New Mexico that uh, shows the territories. In fact, my dad was born in Mexican territory because he was born in 1900. My mother was born in Mexican territory in July because right after that, it became a state, see? So uh, I guess you would say they were Mexicans. I tell my husband now, he, his dad was on the Bracero program, which means that they came over when they were calling them for work the fields, uh, work the mines, uh, and uh, work the railroad. And so he came over in 1918 and um, under the Bracetto program. He married his mother who was here with one of the groups that came in later. She was a resident from way back when, uh, early 1700s, her family. and. Uh, Anyway, uh, as they're saying now in the media, they're saying that if, if a man is born in the United States or a woman to an illegal, 
they're not going to be claimed as American citizens, you know. I says, Ray, that means you got to go back to Mexico at 88 because your dad was an illegal, even if he was for a while under the Bracero program. But after that, he wasn't. I says, what are you going to do in Mexico? I told him. <laughs> I says, do you know anybody out there? <laughs> I says, what are they going to do with the Russians? They've been here. Are they going to card them? What are they going to do with the Norwegians, the people from England, the people from France? Are they going to card them? They're not brown. They may not card them. They could card us because we look a little different. But how about them? Will, be, will we have to show cards? It shows who our nationality is, who we're originally from. Um, that's going to be kind of scary. But I don't think uh, people are saying, well, it won't happen to the white. It, if it's going to happen with one, it's going to happen with all. I don't know. Yeah, I'm Irish and Polish. Okay. <laughs> they, they didn't like us. And either. if you were a first generation and your dad and mom, goodbye. Mm -hmm. Then who's going to be here? The Native Americans. Hey, we got Native American in us. Mm -hmm. We would not have survived if it hadn't been for the Native Americans, you know? I remember one time Corky was always um, inviting the Native Americans. They'd have powwows at the Crusade for Justice. And I'd invite my old aunts. And uh, I remember one time Grandma Blackhorse, she was a Sioux, and she was cooking um, what they call Indian fry bread. I says, how do you say it in Indian? She says, wiggly oompa hoopa. And I looked at her, I says, okay, wiggly oompa hoopa. And uh, so she's cooking away, and my aunt comes by, and she starts talking to her in Spanish. I says, Tia, I says, that means aunt. She is Indian. She does not speak Spanish. But she's making buñuelos. That's the Indian fry bread in Spanish. I says, that's Spanish food. I says, no, yeah, that's Indian food. We would not have survived at Hammond for our Native American family, that portion of us. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, even the, uh, the Jamestown folks, all of them. I've got this uh, film now that, that came out, America, story about us, about the entire series. And um, if it hadn't been for the Native Americans, I mean, after many of them we killed, as Americans, I say we, and that's including whatever race, because we brought in the diseases of the East, uh, of the New World, of the Old World, to the New World, and yet they still helped us to survive. And they helped us to survive in, like in San Luis, that was before Jamestown, the oldest town in Colorado. That was before Jamestown. And uh, that was where the family of Corky Gonzalez's uh, wife, that's her family, she came from there. So, it's a strange world. Yeah, it is a strange world. It's uh -huh. a strange time. It's exciting, though. You know, people are excited. If you get to know them and you hear their stories, it's wonderful. I'm sure your mom and dad have wonderful stories, yeah. especially the Irish. They're going through some bad stuff right now, yeah. you know? I mean, we're not the only ones. It's mankind with mankind. What are you going to do there? <laughs> we have such a... Oh, the good Lord must look down and say, oh, my children, <laughs> oh, you're all the same, turn you inside out, there's no difference. Yeah. So about all these, I know, I'm sure somebody must ask you all the time, what do you think about um, the Arizona laws? How do you think, how do you think this is all going to pan out, you know, living through all the, you know, civil rights struggles and everything? How do you think, how do you think it's going to end up? Well... It's, they're trying to do all kinds of changes now. Uh, Arizona is opening up a can of worms because right now they're even trying to change the Constitution. What happened to the motto of, of America? You know, bring me your weak and you're starving and you're, you know, this land is huge. Um, true, there are some bad ones that come in with drugs to sell and this. But I would say the majority of the people just want to work because there's no work for them out there. There's no work. Wherever they're at, South America, Ecuador, 
even Europe, you know. Um, and uh, on that side of the border, they're killing their own people. On that side of the wall, you know, uh, you build walls and fences to keep people out, but all you do is create more and more problems for yourself, you know. Um, I think there's just another way that could be handled besides the way that they're looking at handling it right now with that law. I think the governor uh, meant well uh, in what she thinks and it's her upbringing that makes that whatever that upbringing was. Um, I'm sure it has a lot of hatred for our people. Um, so, like I say, uh, people in power can do whatever they want to do when they're in that kind of power. And uh, if you have the money backing it, that even moves it more. But basically, there's some great Americans out here that don't agree with that. Um, but they're not in power. They say the vote is there. Yes, the vote is there, but here again, you give power to individuals, and with them, you bring their baggage. And their baggage could be whatever their background is of experiences and problems and issues. And I don't agree with the, with the law. I agree with America, what she stands for. And that's, that's not where it's going right now. It's thinking, it's thinking um, like uh, Germany thought. It's, it's thinking like uh, dictatorships think, you know. Um, we're a free nation, we're not dictators, we're, we're a free nation. We're more blessed than any other nation in the world. And if we keep going with this atrocities, I guess we're just inviting God's wrath of, hey, this is it. Come home, those that are going to him immediately, and leave the rest to kill themselves here. Because that's probably what they're going to do. Yeah. So we'll see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's kind of exciting. It's kind of scary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, uh, let me gather my thoughts here. Um, is there anything um, that maybe we didn't touch on that you wanted to talk about? When you're talking about yourself, it's kind of hard because, especially if you lived a long time, you got, you, you've just touched a little bit of the... One of these days, I'm going to write a book. I'm going to write about all the children that we have. They're wonderful, their experiences that we've had with them. Uh, they're great kids, every one of them. But they have, they have given us some wild experiences, but they've been supportive of us, and they still are. Not only them, but their husbands or their wives, and definitely the children, the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren, you know. We have been totally blessed. Only two live far away, and that's our former Airborne Ranger who married a young girl by the name of Frances Castaneda who comes from a big family, and she won't leave her mom, which is typical of, of the uh, Chicana ladies. <laughs> and then my son, uh, Carlos, who joined the Navy. He's out in Jacksonville, Florida, a business owner, and, and he loves it there. So, but the rest are all... I'm very blessed. I have them all around me like, like a mother hen. Oh, well, that's good. Mm -hmm. That's good. I'm what advice blessed. would you give to uh, future, especially future Latinos, uh, maybe listening to this interview a hundred years from now? What what advice would you give them? I'm always giving advice, especially in the music arena. Uh, we worked at Casa Bonita for years. We started there in 1974, and uh, we finally 
we left there when I went to New Mexico to, I uh, was working with the government then in Taos. And then uh, when we came back after leaving to Arizona and then going to Casper, Wy or um, Cheyenne, Wyoming, and then coming back to Denver. And then we went back to Casa Bonita and I see these young artists, oh, you play, they tell my husband, you play such great guitar. And he does. And he says, and you do too, and you have a wonderful voice, they tell me. And I'd say, thank you. I'm going to be a guitar player too. And I advise them. And I know it probably, if the mother heard me, she'd probably have a fit, but I would say, okay, you want to be a guitarist and a singer? You be the best you can be. I mean, go all out. Do it with your whole heart. But if you're going to mix booze or drugs, Forget the guitar, go into booze. I mean, kill yourself. Let your liver hang out and go out the door. If you're gonna be a drug addict, let your brain fry, but don't mix those, don't mix the music and these two wonderful, uh, awful, this beautiful music. Don't mix that, the music and the guitar with these two awful atrocities of booze and alcohol. It says, you're not a musician if you're dealing with those. If you're going to be a musician, be the best that you can be, because it's a gift. It makes people happy. You're happy just listening to us, I tell them. And of course, my husband says, do you have to say that? And I says, because it's true. You want these kids to think about that. So you're always giving advice. You know, you give advice to young women, they're going to be mothers, you know. I wish they could all be at home, like my youngest daughter, and be a stay-at-home mom raise the children, but I know it's impossible. So you give advice there, you know, and you have, uh, nowadays you have uh, extended families, they're called, and you give advice there. Reach out, never, never uh, leave the say if it's a divorce, never leave that mother or that father out of the picture because you will be married to that man if you divorce him the rest of your life. And that child needs to have the whole family support. Even if you marry again, that child will be blessed. She'll have two dads, two mothers. She'll be blessed or he'll be blessed. And that child will know and grow with wonderful strength because she knows she'll be loved, because you've opened that door, never sealed that door. So that's the advice I give young women. And I don't give too much advice to young men. My husband gets mad because he says, you should tell blah, 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 so-and-so and so-and-so of our sons. You can't do that. Not if you want them. If you want your sons to be uh, apron string kids, mother's apron strings, then yes. But uh, it's best that they have to learn to make decisions. I even tell the girls that, make decisions. You're not gonna make them right all the time, but the important thing is, it's your decision and you made it. Right or wrong, you're gonna learn from it. Nobody, I'm not going to condemn you, because it's your decision to make as a grown-up. I made them for you when you were young, but I'm not making them for you now that you're <laughs> a mature woman and man. You don't want that responsibility. <laughs> no, I don't. Uh -uh. <laughs> yeah, I don't blame yeah. you. <laughs> All, right. All right. Well, I think I, I am out of questions, and I'm sure you're, you're a little tired. You're <laughs> ready for a break, right? Okay, that All sounds right. like a winner. Oops. Right. Sorry, I bent down. No, you're... <laughs> uh, there's another thing, too, on that Arizona law, and this is um, a lot of our young men that come from Latin America or Mexico or Central America, I should say, they, the United States has offered them the opportunity to fight for our country and become a citizen without going through the courses and classes, but to die for our country, if need be, and they'd be American citizens. With this law, does that, would that interfere with that law and say, okay, we made you American citizens, but we're taking it away even if they're wounded, missing a limb, missing an arm, I mean, who knows? What would happen to that law? Because they would be not born here. It's really a can of worms that 
this governor has created. She's really got to think this out. I don't think she's thought it out. You think uh, you think it started like one thing and then just escalated? I don't think it, I don't think she thought it out. I think the pressures was put on her and and uh, she just went with the flow. You know, the, pretty soon that river can just carry you. The river of thought, the river of of push, and. Uh, I don't think she thought it out before she made that statement to, that she has made and that she presented that law, you know. She really has to do some heavy thinking. I'm sure she's pretty smart, but does she have that kind of power on her own to say, hey, I was wrong with this? Who does she have to reach out to to say, hey, this is wrong? That's very interesting. Anyway, uh, there's a lot of thought there that she's got to put into it. Yeah. Because there's a lot of men that have died, and there's a lot of men and women that are fighting out there that are not part of our, not born into the Constitution of the United States, under the wonderful country that we live in. But yet they are considered American citizens because they were willing to do a wonderful thing. And that's fight for a country that is not their own. I know my husband, when he was in the 82nd Airborne, the second time he re-enlisted, he was jump master. And he was training Mexican jump master, or jump, jumpers, airborne. And the reason they asked him to do that is because he was Latino and he was Spanish-speaking. And it worked out pretty good. And they're pretty tough soldiers, he said. Yeah. You know? I've never met anybody of, of Mexican descent that was not a hard-working person, I have to be honest with you. So, yeah. Just given the opportunity. Yeah. And, of course, you do have your little... There's always going to be some of those. And what can you do? Yeah. Maybe it's part of their upbringing, I don't know. Spoiled kids, I don't know. We have spoiled kids everywhere. Yeah. Doesn't matter where or how. Oh, goodness me. We're the human race. We're human beings. Yeah. Thank we'll you. see, yeah, thank you, thank you very much.